We've got your Raiders covered. Knock on wood if you're with me. It's Silver and Black today on CBS Sports Radio 1140. And now, here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Welcome back to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140 in Las Vegas. And for the first time in 97 straight weeks, we are taking a break. You will be listening to a best of the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio. Today, three great conversations. The first on the late, great John Matuzak with author Steve Delshin. Then we talked to Professor Travis Vogan about the history of NFL films and the Raiders. And lastly, our extended talk with former troubled Raiders quarterback Todd Marinovich. You don't want to miss that one and we will be back live next week don't forget don't miss any raiders news check out our website silverandblacktoday.com another week it will have been 30 years since the passing of the infamous and great uh john matuzak of course raiders won two super bowls with the raiders in 77 and 81 and uh a larger than life figure and we're going to talk about him for the remainder of this hour just a fascinating story, and we are joined now uh, by someone who knows him very well because Steve Delson, of course, co-author of more than a half dozen books, including Jim Brown's biography, Out of Bounds, a book on the Bears, talk, and one that I love because, because Steve and I are both originally from Chicago, Talking Irish, the Oral History of the Notre Dame Football. That's a good one for me as well. But Steve is a Peabody Award winner of ESPN for Outside the Lines on the Concussion Crisis. Go watch it. You can find it up online. He's now the president of Delson uh, Delson Strategies uh, and an Emmy Award nominee for his series on the Penn State football crisis as well. You can check him out at Delson. That's D-E-L-S-O-H-N dot com. But the reason we're talking to him is because he co-authored. Cruising with the Twos, 1985 John Matuzak's autobiography, and we go now to Los Angeles and welcome Steve in. How are you doing this morning, Steve? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Doing, hey, Steve. doing fantastic. Uh, just a fascinating subject uh, to talk about, of course, uh, John Matuzak and, uh, and, and his life and times, and, and you have a lot of stories, which were some in the book, some not in the book, of course. Uh, but before we explore that and explore him as a person, as a player, including his childhood and his career, how did you come to be the co-author of his autobiography? Uh, there was a guy named Joe Weeder who had founded a magazine called Muscle and Fitness. Yeah, and it was kind of like it was kind of legendary among people that worked out. Um, he was the person who discovered Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think, mostly. And Joe had a magazine, like I said, Muscle and Fitness. He wanted to. He was starting a new magazine. I helped him start a new magazine. He wanted to kind of uh, combine weightlifting with mainstream sports, uh, and the magazine was called Sports Fitness back then. It later morphed into Men's Fitness, which is more of a fitnessy magazine, but back then it was pretty hardcore sports slash weightlifting. And we did a cover piece on the Tuesday, and I was the writer and we got to know each other a little bit, and he mentioned that he was thinking of doing a book, and that led to me becoming his co-author. Oh, nice! Yeah, fascinating. I mean, that, and that's yeah, you know, so many things like that. I think. Uh, I mean, obviously, you're a talented journalist and writer, Steve. So it wouldn't be surprising to have uh, someone uh, come to you and help them write a book. Uh, with Matuzak, I, I want to explore because you spent a lot of time with him. Um, you look at his childhood uh, and 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 how that may have led to the man he became, including the kind of outrageous stuff. But he was a tall beanpole kind of kid, bulked up, played football. Um, his his upbringing uh, in in Wisconsin, suburban Milwaukee, of course, um, he lost two brothers uh, to cystic fibrosis at an early age, uh, living in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. When you, I, I'm sure you didn't dwell on that a lot with him, but when you talk to him about that, how much did that early life of his contribute to the man he would become and the two's person, persona that we know today? Oh, I think a lot. You know, I think anybody's childhood is formative. And you know, his father was a former Marine, uh, not real talkative with John, you know, kind of a taciturn guy. Um, John felt that the only time he talked to him for the most part was if he had screwed something up. 
Oh. Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of verbal affection. He was close with his mother. She was kind of his best friend, his anchor, I think, growing up. Um, but as you mentioned, he lost two little brothers to cystic fibrosis, which was devastating for the entire family. I think there's, you know, it's hard to figure out the human mind, but for anybody, and Matuzak was a complicated person, but I wouldn't be shocked if he felt some survivor's guilt. You know, I lost my little brother, is why am I here? Uh, I think he was damaged by that, as was his entire family. Um, you know, I was looking at the book again over the weekend, and I was struck by how tall and skinny he was uh, in high school. And, you know, he hadn't really filled out yet. He looked kind of gangly and awkward. And I think there were kids that made fun of him. Uh, you know, bullying is part of probably most kids' lives, but that doesn't make it any less, you know, painful at the time. Oh, sure. Um, and then, he, you know, he started to fill out. He became a football star in high school. He's also a star in basketball in the shot put. A lot of people don't realize, I think, that he was that good an athlete across the board. Um, but that started to become his identity. Um, you know, he was the star athlete. He was already tall. He started to get muscular. And he was bigger than everybody else. Um, and I think from a fairly... I wouldn't, you know, the, the, the legend of the twos kind of got cemented when he was in the NFL, but I think even from high school, college on, um, he started to become this larger than life figure to a lot of people. Yeah. And I think he tried, I think he tried to live up to that, you know, also, which was part of the problem. Sure. Again, we're talking to Steve Delson, who was the co author of uh, the book Cruising with the Twos, the autobiography of John Matuzak, who passed away 30 years ago next week. Uh, partly due to uh, an overdose of prescription medications. And you talked about his childhood. Uh, just one thing, I mean, to, to show you, because one thing you hear about uh, John Matuzak, before we jump into the football piece, is that, you know, deep down under that exterior, he really, number one, cared about kids. And, and you can understand that losing two young brothers. But when he was 12 or 13, his two-year-old, his, his two-year-old brother dies, and he took it upon himself to buy shoes for his baby brother to be buried in because he heard his mother crying that her son's feet had gotten swollen when he died. Uh, and, and those types of things, you know, stick with a, a guy. And, and you, you, you try, especially if you look at the 70s and 80s, you know, today men are told to, to share feelings and all that. Back then, that wasn't necessarily the case. So Matuzak, coming out of that childhood, then goes off to the University of Missouri because he's now a football star in high school. He gets in trouble off the field, Steve. Uh, then he transfers to the University of Tampa, becomes the first pick in the NFL draft, the 73 draft. Uh, but he kind of bounces around. He's, he, it's, it's not, I don't think, an exaggeration to say he was a bust, considered where he was drafted. So Al Davis signs him in Oakland. Uh, was that just the match made in heaven that allowed him to, to kind of live out that persona and, and to become that larger-than-life figure? Yeah, but let's back up for a second because there's a couple interesting things. You know, he, he went to the Houston Oilers. He was the first pick in the entire draft, as you said, and they were just a train wreck. Uh, they were a horrible team. They had uh, a lot of dissension internally. Uh, Sid Gilman was this old school NFL guy who became the coach after John got there, and he didn't care for Matuzak at all. There was a strike going on. The NFLPA was on strike, and Sports Illustrated at a certain point took a photograph of Matuzak holding up a sign that said something like, I've got the words, but it would refer to the strike, and he had like a fist up in the air. And so he was suddenly perceived as kind of this radical guy, which he was radical in certain ways, but he wasn't really radical politically. Right. Um, you, know, you know, again, middle-class kid from Milwaukee, son of a, a Marine. Um, so he jumped from the Houston Oilers to the World Football League, which was this fledgling league. And I think he played like literally seven plays. And then there were a bunch of cops on the sidelines uh, <laughs> that served him with a subpoena that had been sent there by the Houston Oilers. Um, and then he went over to Kansas City, where he almost died uh, one night of an overdose um, he was taking downers and drinking. 
Uh, Paul Wiggins, the head coach of the Chiefs, rode with him in the ambulance and reportedly was pounding on Matuzak's chest at one point because it looked like Matuzak had stopped breathing. Um, by the time he got to the, and then they traded him to the Redskins, he lasted, I think, a month. Um, by the time he got to the Raiders, he was on his way out of the league. And he wasn't just a boss. He would have gone down in history as probably one of the all-time you know, busts in NFL history. From first-round draft pick to three or four years into his career, he's on his way out of the league probably going to play in the Canadian Football League. And then uh, Al Davis, who owned the Raiders at the time, uh, signed Matuzak after first doing a little bit of due diligence. I think he talked to Ted Hendricks, the legendary linebacker for the Raiders, and asked him about Matuzak. And I think Hendricks looked around you know, at the locker room, which had a lot of characters in it, and said something like, you know, what's one more? <laughs> well, and, and Steve, uh, we're going we're gonna to go to a break here in a few minutes, but you mentioned the story about the Chiefs. That same night, uh, he his wife tried to run him over with a car, if I recall, uh, and then he, he fled to a cemetery, hid behind a gravestone, and then he made up with his wife or girlfriend or whatever it was at the time, and then he he got into trouble, and you're, and you're right. Uh, his coach in Kansas City uh, basically got him to the hospital and saved his life. Uh, we're going to pick it up after the break with some more stories. We're talking to Steve Delson, uh, author of Cruising with the Twos, the autobiography of... John Matuzak. So don't go anywhere. You're listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. The only way to take Silver and Black today with you is with the Radio.com app. Download it today and search CBS Sports Radio 1140 in Las Vegas and listen to us anytime, anywhere. Welcome welcome back to Silver and Black today. We're speaking with Steve Delson, who wrote the book Cruising with the Twos, the autobiography of John Matuzak. And we're talking about the fascinating character that was John Matuzak on almost the 30th anniversary of his untimely passing. Now, Steve, when we look at John Matuzak, the football player, of course, he had those great years in Oakland, 77, 81, two Super Bowl rings, um, but he never quite could sustain it. Was was that directly due to that off the field trouble, the the abuse of alcohol, of drugs, um, and did he leave a lot on the table that he that he could have really turned himself into one of the better players of the game? Yeah, I mean, I think there were a lot of things. He had some legitimate, serious injuries, um, which can happen to anyone and did happen to pretty much anyone, you know, played in the NFL. Um, but definitely his behavior off the field, you know, staying up all night, you know, showing up at practice, probably was still alcohol in his blood. That probably happened all the time. Um, there's no way, you know, that that couldn't have had an effect on his performance, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, there were a lot of guys on the Raiders, and that doesn't justify John's behavior, but it was absolutely part of the culture on that particular team. Um, you know, at that particular time, you had Kenny Stabler, whose famous line was, you know, used to read the playbook by the light of the jukebox, I think. <laughs> yep. Uh, he probably said it more artfully, but, you know, all those guys, Phil Villapiano, Hendricks, you know, it was a really hard drinking team. Um, and in some ways, it was a good place for Matuzak. Um, because Al Davis and John Madden allowed the players to be individuals. They weren't hung up on having a million rules. Um, but it was also a hard party team. And, uh, you know, that probably contributed to Matuzak's drinking. Although I got to say, at that point in his life, um, you know, it probably wouldn't have mattered what team he was on. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was, he was a wild guy. He had a self destructive streak. Um, clearly. And I think, you know, like I said earlier, as his legend grew, um, you know, he wanted to be the biggest and the baddest. Um, I went out drinking with him one time. I wasn't drinking. I thought we were working, actually. We were working <laughs> uh, but I saw a side of him that kind of shocked me a little bit at the time. Because um, when I was working with him, he seemed like his head was in a good place. And we spent a fair amount of time, you know, you get together a couple times a week typically with somebody when you're writing a book and you 
turn on your tape recorder and do the interviews. And I only saw him party once over that entire period of time. I don't know what he was doing when I wasn't with him, but when I was around him, he seemed like he was healthy, seemed to be in a pretty good place emotionally. Uh, but we went to this legendary bar in Hollywood, uh, Imperial Gardens. They have sushi and sake. And I had my tape recorder. I realized a few minutes in, we probably weren't going to get any work done. Um, and he ordered sake. And, you know, most people would order, you know, one drink at a time. Uh, <laughs> and he, he ordered 16 little cups of sake. Oh, my gosh. 16? <laughs> now, they were, little, they were little cups, but there were 16 little cups. And I don't think I had any of it. Um, and he drank it all. And I forgot how long it took, but I think it didn't take that long. And suddenly, I, I, you know, I don't remember exactly how this started, but there was a man and his wife were kind of arguing at the bar. And it was not a loud argument, uh, but they were arguing. And Matuzak stood up and started lecturing the guy. Who didn't like it, obviously, but, you know, he was Matuzak. Um, <laughs> and then, I don't remember if I went to the bathroom or what happened, but I took my eyes off Matuzak for a minute, and the next thing I knew, he was kind of standing up in the one of the open spaces, like between the bar and where the restaurant tables were, and he was doing karate moves. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, you know, first of all, you realize, when a guy that big is doing karate, like how much ground he covers. Um, and, but it was scary, you know, and he knew, he knew some karate and he was, you know, he was split basically. And what struck me at that moment that night was, if you've ever seen people who just at a certain point when they're drinking, they almost become a, another person entirely. It's almost like a switch goes yeah. on. Yep. And you just don't recognize that person anymore. That's what happened with Matuzak that night. Um, yeah, and, and, and that, that seems to be a common theme. Now, we have a, a couple minutes left, Steve, uh, and I know we could probably go on for two hours talking about the time you spent with him because uh, such a colorful guy. But the end of John Matuzak, of course, we all know what happened um, with, with, the, with the, the drug-induced um, uh, heart attack and overdose and all of that. Was there a different, was this going to be the ending? I mean, John tried to stay clean. The longest he could go was 89 days. Was this, was this something that was going to happen probably no matter what? Um, he, it, it, it's surprising, honestly, that he lived as long as he did uh. because he was so wild. Um, he didn't do well with leaving football even though he had a good career in Hollywood, that was part of the tragedy of it. You know, he did have something going on in his life. Uh, but he just he just struggled so much with self-control. Um, I don't know if... You know, the other thing, too, is we weren't talking about CTE back in those days. Right, exactly. And I have, and I have no clue, you know the condition of his brain, but he played a lot of football for a lot of years. He probably had some brain damage to some degree. I think every single ex-football player does. They may not have CTE, but they probably have some long-term brain damage. Right, and, and Steve, um, we're, we're coming up on a, on a hard out here. but and, and, of course, you won your Peabody Award for um, part of a series in, on uh, Outside the Lines about the concussion crisis. And, and, and of course, we won't, we'll never know with John Matuzak because he's gone, and this is before players uh, knew what was going on and could donate their brains for study as well. So, uh, Steve, we appreciate you being on. Make sure you visit Delson, D-E-L-S-O-H-N.com, where you can hear more about um, what Steve is doing now. It does great work consulting. Steve, thanks for joining us and uh, getting everybody up to speed on what it was like to be around John Matuzak. You're very welcome. I appreciate you guys having me on. All Thanks, Steve. right. Thanks, Come Steve. back. Happy Sunday, everybody. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, emanating from the future home of your Raiders, Las Vegas, Nevada. 
Big thanks to Steve Delson, of course, the author who wrote the autobiography, uh, co-wrote the autobiography of John Matuzak with the twos, cruising with the twos to be exact. Uh, fascinating discussion. We, we, of course, couldn't get to all of it with him uh, because there's just so much. I mean, uh, not only was Matuzak a colorful guy, uh, but the stories and and the legacy, if you will, if you want to call it that, of the player, of the man off the field is is pretty remarkable. And uh, we want to continue that conversation uh, here with Kelly Kreiner, Chaz Osborne, my co-host and myself a little bit. And guys, you know, Steve talked about the question I asked him about was, was this going to be the ending for John Matuzak no matter what? The, 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 the drugs, the alcohol, the partying, uh, combined with the injuries he sustained playing football, especially to his back, was that going to be his end? Was it always going to be a fast, quick, young end? He died at 38 years of age in 1989 in Los Angeles. Um, and that seemed to be... Now, Steve said that he should have probably died earlier because of right. how, how hard he partied. Um, my question for you guys on this one is, and knowing he talked about Stabler, he talked about Villapiana, who we've had on our show many times, a great guy. Um, the way those guys, as hard as they went, could that, e- I mean, I don't think you could even do 25% of what they did then off the field uh, now in the NFL. Could you? I mean, you couldn't. Oh no! Yeah, with the way social media and everything is, um, if yeah, it, it, everything would be it'd be all over the place. The NFL would be on everybody. You know, you'd be headlining Sports Center, <laughs> Fox News all the time. I mean, it, it would be a circus. You know, back in the day, there wasn't as much media going around, and the media would cover for those guys too. It's like oh, wow. you you see all the stuff that he got caught up in. Think of how much stuff never reached anything because it got buried. Yeah, and a lot of there'd be so many more suspensions and those kind of things now with all the new rules. And and you know they, he talked about you know how they played back then. They they actually changed a lot of the rules nowadays because of the way those guys played back in the day. So it's, it is unfortunate his ending. Um, real name. You know his childhood and and uh, younger drug problems and. Unfortunately, that probably was the only way that it was going to end, and uh, you know, it's, he was he was a polarizing figure, and and that's one one thing we didn't want to see. No, well, and and again, you know, the, the thing about reading everything I could about uh, John Matuzak in preparation for the show, um, you know, you, you see a guy who with children was phenomenal. I mean, he he would go to children's hospitals, uh, obviously from his own experience and losing losing his um, his two brothers and then later his sister to cystic fibrosis. Here was a man who was very caring. Yep. And, and just people said when he got around kids, he was so, so um, attentive to them and and um, just, you know, a different person. And so you, you, I think you always have to put into context, as much as we hear about the partying and all that stuff, you know, there's more of a human being than right. just that persona, than the actor, than the football player. And I think it's important that we represent that. And that's one of the reasons why I talked about st- – Talk to talk about it with Steve uh, as well. And we have a caller on the line now, Audrey, who wants to talk about John Matuzak. Audrey, welcome to Silver and Black today. Thank you, and thank you for the lovely things you're saying. I, I hope you know the good side of John like I did. I'm going to cry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. That's okay. My son loved children. <laughs> He was a good guy. There were two Johns, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, I love my son with all my heart. Well, well, uh, Miss Matuzak, I, I want to thank you for calling in. And I know, I'm sorry, I know those wounds. Uh, being a father uh, of five children myself, um, you know, I know the, and, and my wife lost her sister when she was young. And her parents, you know, when you lose a child, doesn't matter what age, uh, you don't, you don't ever, uh, it doesn't go away. It's always with you, and um, you know I was I was honored to to learn about your son and to know about the good things that he had done too. Because we do we hear a lot about, of course, the persona, right, the twos. But um, you know the story about about one of your sons passing and and him buying the shoes and all of that. It shows the heart. It shows. Uh, I've got to tell you another good story. Okay, great. He told his sister that had cystic fibrosis that if she if he made it big 
in the NFL or any place. He would send her anywhere in the world. And if he didn't, he was going to take her to a little park to play. And when she turned 16, when she turned 16, my other daughter, Karen, was married and lived in Panama. And he sent on because she wanted to go to Panama to see her sister. <laughs> wow. Well, and, and <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, you know, your, your, your son, uh, and again, I, I, in, in reading about him and, and, and the upbringing and what you all went through as a family, um, was, was it hard for him uh, as he got older? Was, was the, the, having lost his brothers and then his sister, was, was that something that maybe... No, his sister died after... Died after he passed. Okay. After. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when, 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 when his brothers passed, at a very, both at very early ages, of course... Um, well, you know, he, he was so disappointed because... Uh, the first boy, Christopher, was a twin to my daughter, Christine, uh, and he felt gypped because he wanted a little brother so bad. Yeah. Wow. And is that, but is that something that you think, was it, was it something that the pain from that, uh, that I know you and your whole family dealt with, was the pain from that something that you feel contributed to him masking it with those things like alcohol and, and whatnot? Most definitely. Um John would walk into a room, I'm, I swear to you, and, and it was like he took over the room. He was like a magnet. But <laughs> when he was bad, he was really, really bad. And I think it was because he, in his mind, he's always like, why am I still alive? And they're not. Yeah. That, it, was, it really bothered him a lot. And I don't know. how close he was to the niece. And, you know, and even his nieces and nephews, he'd have his niece and his three nephews out and, you know, about buying toys, doing something with them. <clears throat> and somebody would say, hey, John, are those your kids? He said, you bet. He never <laughs> said they were his nephews and niece. <clears throat> and he adored them all. And he, he he just brought them out to California. They did things together. He loved his sisters, you know. And there's so many good parts of him that you, you can't explain it because people see this and he had this facade. He had to be a raider. He had to be tough. He had to, sure. you know, it was a part of his, uh, it was part of his show. Yeah. Well, and, and, and he was, I mean, as a football player, as an actor, of course, an entertainer. And so I understand that. And, and, uh, but, but today, you know, I think that we live in a different time, right? Where, uh, men's, men's mental health is still an issue. Uh, but to be able to deal with, those issues. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that, that he wasn't able to, but we, we wanted to make sure that we remembered some of those positive things as well. And we certainly appreciate you calling oh, in and to I share appreciate this. Your story. I, I love it. I'm not complaining about any of it. Oh no, it's no. True. Yeah, no, no. And I, I appreciate that, uh, Ms. Yeah. Matuzak. And, and I would love uh, if you could, uh, David, our engineer, uh, will, as I, as I say goodbye to you, I just want to get your number if that's okay with you. Cause I'd like to call you, um, because we, we want to do a story for our website, too, about John, and I'd love to talk to you a little bit more in depth on that for that. Um, are you asking my mom for her phone number? This is Karen, her, oh. her daughter. Hi, Karen. Hi. Yeah, we will. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put you on the line with our engineer, and if there's a, just a way to contact her, that would be great. Whatever, whatever you're comfortable with, we appreciate it. Okay, sure, that's fine. Okay, thank you guys for calling in. Please uh, give your mother my best. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, there you have it. Uh, a surprise guest, uh, Audrey Matuzak, John Matuzak's mother. It's powerful stuff. It was. Uh, and, and she was obviously listening to the show and listening to Steve Delson uh, come on and talk about that. But again, you know, as I was saying, you know, uh, 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 there's more to a man than just uh, the, the explosive and the mistakes. We right. all make mistakes. We all do things. Uh, but there are two sides to every person. Like she said, he, he's trying to live up to that, that Raiders mystique himself, and so he only wants to show that tough guy side. Yeah. You know, and then behind the scenes, you know, he's doing a lot of great things, kids, like we talked about. You know, and she did talk about, you know, his survivor's guilt, what, what Steve Delshawn was talking about as well. Mm-hmm. And, and Kelly, I mean, you, you, the first time I've ever had somebody's mother call in, but, you know, Audrey Matuzak, a mother who, who lost four children. I was going to say, yeah, it's, it's not just that it was, you know, John. It was all for, and it's it's also how, you know, cystic fibrosis is not something. I mean, that's very tough to bring up kids like that. And then to see the one, you know, John was like the one that didn't have the affliction. 
but he had he had other issues like you know the addiction and everything like that yep. take him so young i mean it's just yeah. brutal well and that and that's the key i mean again and and i want to thank audrey matuzak for for listening to the show and and being happy with how we were talking about john because his story is a mixed bag i mean there's bad things and and she recognized them uh and but she wanted to come on the show and and just talk about the good side of that and we want to recognize that too as well and and that goes for all these raiders you know uh, Lyle Alzado, of course, Ken Stabler, we know a lot about, and 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 Phil Villapiano, who we've had come on, who you know has had a beautiful family, beautiful kids, um, and so just fascinating to explore that. Um, and uh, this show has turned very interesting, and, yeah. and we and, appreciate that. And you said it's a mixed bag, but more often than not, it's the bad stuff that you hear about with guys like this because that's more interesting for people. You know, it's like yeah. they want to hear yeah. about because people love to tear people down and yeah, then, right. build, then build them back up. That's the American way. Absolutely. It's like if they we build you up, make you famous or something, we destroy you and then we can't wait for that comeback. Yep. Yes. Well, I know. I know. And us being on the radio, we get lots of people who have nice things to say. Unfortunately, about. John didn't uh, get that comeback. We're going to step aside when we come back. We're going to talk Kelly's Corner, Canada. We're li- you're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Hey, this is Rodney Hudson. You're listening to Silver and Black Today. Indeed. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today here on this Sunday, 16 days until the start of training camp for your Raiders. We're talking to Travis Vogan, who wrote the book Keepers of the Flame, NFL Films, and the Rise of Sports Media. Now, Travis, um, we we were going to play Autumn Wind coming in from the break uh, because that piece of music, that piece of audio... Uh, was something that, it, you know, for Raiders fans, obviously it's Raiders religion. Anthem. Yep. It's Yeah, it's an anthem. Now, when you look at the Raiders brand, of course, Al Davis, number one, right? He created that brand. He perpetuated it. Every All the, the goodness, the badness of it, the outlaw nature of it. But how much did did that give a canvas for Steve Sable to help them build that brand and to help them become the bad guys of the NFL? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I, the NFL films loved uh, doing pieces on the Raiders precisely because they had that foundation, not only with Al Davis, but with the, the color scheme, with the mascot, with the types of players who Al Davis would uh, put under contract and the way that he kind of fostered a culture of individuality, as long as it didn't get in his way. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he, he loved uh, representing the Raiders. They really gave him a kind of framework to, to let his own imagination kind of run free. And I think the Autumn Wind is a great illustration of that. Probably the best known uh, writing that Sable ever did. Yeah, I feel like along with Al Davis, Ed and Steve <clears throat> Sable don't get enough credit for for the growth and the popularity, you know, they don't nearly get enough credit for the growth and the popularity of the NFL these days. Yeah, I think you're right. And I mean, the Raiders in particular, one of the things that the NFL, that NFL films did is they were able to create kind of national brands for certain teams. And so the Raiders were one of them as the bad guys. Right. But then the Cowboys being America's team, that's right. something that that NFL films did as well. And the Packers kind of being the more old school, Lombardi driven team. And so, you know, the Raiders were one of those kind of archetypes that they created for um, the league's different clubs. And, and was it Ed that coined the phrase, the uh, America's team for the Cowboys? No, I think it was, it was a producer named Bob Ryan who came up with that um, at NFL films. Um, It was for a yearly highlight film for the, Cowboys and NFL films made yearly highlight films for every team every year. And they decided at some point that that would be a appropriate uh, nickname for that team because of the kind of, uh, you know, their mascot, the Cowboys, the star, the kind of America mythic American elements wrapped up in that. I felt it was funny that um, George Hallis was probably one of the biggest detractors uh, uh, in the beginning because he thought when NFL films showed up, maybe they were spying, basically, right? And then he was the yeah, one that coined, yeah. the, coined the phrase, the keeper of the flame, correct? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think with someone like Hallis, he was there at the beginning of the NFL. 
and he was pretty entrenched in the tradition. Oh, yeah. And I think having something like a film crew, even though it seems standard now that you're just going to be surrounded by media at a pro game, wasn't so much the case back then. And he found him to be a nuisance and maybe unnecessary. He didn't really realize the potential of the marketing that they provided. Right. And I think after a couple of years, he realized, wow, this is really valuable. It's um, growing the league. It's growing the Bears. And, and he came to really appreciate what they were up to. Very distinct approach. Well, and you look at the, as you mentioned in your book, during the 70s, the Raiders and Al Davis insisted that the NFL films, when they would do that year-end highlight film, that every player was named or mentioned in yeah. that film. Uh, so it shows you the owners quickly found out uh, that these these pieces were important for them internally. Uh, and once they got over the, the idea that it wasn't going to be negative towards them, that it was actually a positive marketing tool, uh, they got on board. Now, if we look at this, and, and for, for Raiders fans, NFL films and the autumn wind and all of this is so so very vital to the team's history. But NFL films now, so if you look at that, as you go through your book, you talk about the differences, and even Steve Sable said something about this, that, hey, every every kind of dog has its day. NFL Films, still very involved, still part of the league, still part of the NFL channel now uh, on on cable television, uh, but it's a much different thing. And that's because of us. We're consuming media differently. How has that changed Uh, NFL Films? Well, I mean, when NFL Films started out, this was sort of before cable television, before ESPN. Um, You were only seeing highlights on during its syndicated programs on Tuesdays, if you weren't watching, for instance, live broadcast. Now that's obviously changed, and you can see sports not only any time, but any place with their phones. And so it's made NFL films a little bit less vital in terms of its informative functions, right? We're not going to NFL films to kind of see what happened or see highlights because we're already seeing them as the games are going, really. Um, And so it became less vital to the NFL. And so what it wound up doing was kind of being folded more into NFL media and the NFL network. And now it's basically operating in the service of the NFL network, which is more of a promotional slash news organization. Um, It still does create some of the more dramatic stuff, but that's far, far more rare than it was earlier on. It's, it's most noteworthy show now is obviously Hard Knocks, right. which yeah. has some of those kind of epic elements, but is more or less a reality show. Well, and, and the humanity that, that Steve and Ed Sable wanted to show as well, they wanted to show these as people. I mean, until they started NFL Films and were showing close-ups of players behind the face masks, that had not been done before. Uh, the tight spirals on the balls, all those things were different. You get a little bit of that humanity now. I, I watched yesterday on NFL Network oh, sure. the, the marathon of a football life, which are which to me mm-hmm. feels more NFL films ish, if an you NFL will. NFL films production. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. that's 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 something that kind of continues. That's the long form that they have. Yeah, well, yeah. The other and one you that... see that, and those practices are kind of folded into sports media in general. And now, so we'll see kind of a a teaser for a game that's about to be on, on, you know, CBS or whatever. And they'll use kind of a a slow motion spiral, but all of those things are kind of just part of the language we use to talk about football. So NFL films kind of established this language. And now that we have it and we use it, they're not quite as necessary as they once were, which is kind of disappointing to, folks like us who grew up really liking those documentaries one of my favorites growing up too was the football follies um oh yeah those were cool those were great (laughs) talk about how that got started i think they they said they didn't want to show that because they didn't want to upstage show the players you know tripping over them around yeah yeah it was kind of b-roll because these these nfl films had crews at every game so they were seeing a lot of stuff (laughs) and they had documentation of every play and so, you know, things happen that are kind of funny or, or silly. And they created kind of a montage of these moments. And they showed it to the Philadelphia Eagles team just right. to kind of try it out and kind of entertain them because they were based outside of Philly. Um, and they really liked it. And the league was reluctant to have it shown nationally because 
you know, it was presenting these players as, as human. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, um, but then they became one of the, the biggest hits. Yeah, and really great. kind of the beginning of, I mean, think about bloopers, about football follies, you know, where would, where would YouTube be? Right. Exactly. And you put Mel Blank and, and then the Looney Tunes sound effects to that. And, oh. uh, yeah. and then you, you got the wrong way Marshall play and, uh, you know, the, yeah, exactly. the miracle of the Meadowlands and then the slow motion with the. Well, and Travis, be, be, before we let you go here in a few minutes, I want to touch on what Chaz mentioned earlier and what you guys were just talking about now, which is voices. So John Facenda. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk about his involvement, because I think John Facenda, a lot of people think he's probably a big football guy, but that wasn't necessarily the case. But how important of a piece, and did the Sables, what was their appreciation for his contribution? Well, I mean, he was one of the probably three or four big elements that make NFL films NFL films. There's Facenda's voiceover with that sort of booming baritone. The frozen. Um, there's Sables' writing. Um, there's the slow motion cinematography, and then there's um, Spence's musical score, yep. right? Yep. And those four things kind of combine to create that mythic register, mythic sort of language that NFL film built for the league. And Sam Spence, or sorry, um, uh, John Facenda, as the narrator is kind of driving the whole ship. So he's arguably more important than some of those elements, but he's the voice of, of football, really. Yeah, absolutely. Travis Vogan, Associate Professor of American Studies at the University of Iowa, author of the book, Keepers of the Flame, NFL Films, and the Rise of Sports Media. Travis, thanks for holding with us through our difficulties mm-hmm. with the phones. And just an amazing work. We appreciate it, and we'll be watching the rest of the work. I'm sure we'll have you on again because we'd love to continue the conversation around media and the NFL. So, Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah, nice talk to you. Thanks, All Travis. right. Travis Vogan. Again, pick up his book, Keepers of the Flame. Uh, really great work there. Also, he has one on ESPN and uh, ABC Sports as well. That you- Again, you're listening to a special best of the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. We'll be back right after these messages. Welcome back to the first ever best of the silver and black today here on CBS sports radio 1140. Now we bring you our extended conversation with talented, but troubled former Raider quarterback, Todd Marinovich. Welcome back Raider nation. Welcome back. Las Vegas, this hot Sunday, of course it's summertime. So it's always hot in Las Vegas. Our faces are melting off as usual, but I'll take it over shoveling snow folks any day of the week. Happy father's day to all the dads out there uh, and uh, to the families as well, celebrating Dad um, on this Father's Day, of course. Uh, and we're going to, last week, it was, it was crazy, shocking. Uh, we, we talked, of course, with Steve Delson, who's an author who wrote the uh, autobiography, co-wrote the autobiography of former Raiders defensive lineman John Matuzak, of course, who, who died of a drug overdose 30 years ago tomorrow. Um, his mother, Audrey, called the show. She was listening and shared some really poignant memories of her son, um, and uh, was thankful that we were touching on a lot of the positives that he had done because, uh, you know, life, uh, the, the world is full of negatives and um, of people attacking others, and, and we like to bring the stories uh, that, uh, that represent the entire person as well, and it's, it's one of those things I think underscores the point that unless you've walked in someone's shoes, you really don't know the path they're on. Uh, and today um, we welcome former Raiders first-round draft pick, Selected 24th overall by Al Davis in the 1991 draft. Of course, someone himself who's been walking a path not many of us could understand, nor could he until recently. And that is Todd Marinovich. Todd, thanks for being with us here today on Silver and Black today. Right on. It's great to be here, Scott. All right, man. Well, uh, we certainly appreciate you taking the time. And, you know, I have to tell you, we before we you know dive into some of these subjects about you and your life, which I know... Um, uh, you, you, you're probably asked about a lot. We've had a lot of fans, a lot of Raider fans message us over the course of the last year to talk about you and say, Hey, what's going on with Todd? And I think that's a testament to people wanting to see you live a good, happy, fulfilled life. Um, and, and Raider nation, I know, you know, you, you had that brief time there, uh, and we'll talk about that later. But you know, Raider Nation, a good or bad, they roll with you, and um, they might be the worst critics sometimes, but they also have lots of love for you. So I was I was struck by that, and I'm I'm glad you're able to um, spend some time with us. Now they really want to know that journey, and we're going to d- dive into it, of course. 
But how are you doing at present time um, and, and, and everything that's going on in your life? Uh, how do you feel about, about everything? Well, I loved your uh, transition from a Tuzak and, and into my segment, and uh, I couldn't agree more. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, uh, and then when you say the Raider Nation, it, it comes from the top, and it's uh, Mark Davis carrying on the tradition that Al started. And at last year he looked at me and said, Todd, once a Raider, always a Raider. Yeah, and That's just not a slogan. It's, uh, they live it. Yeah. They do. They do but, it. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I kind of really, I went to my first uh, Raider reunion last year because um, and it, if it wasn't for my roommate and uh, best friend with the Raiders at the time, Andrew Glover, encouraging me to go, um, I was listening to my head that, that nobody would want to see me, uh, you know, they roll their eyes, all, all, the, all this fantasy, <laughs> really, <laughs> that, that fantasy, and it was one of the most incredible weekends of my life. Um, and now I'm, I'm part of it. I'll go every year. And that's what it's moving to Vegas. I know it's crazy. And, <laughs> and, and that's the thing, you know, we, we, we are, um, we have been, the, the Raiders are so active in this community already, um, Todd. And, and, you know, Vegas, Vegas has all the vice, right? Everybody knows about that, but the community outside of that side of the city is pretty significant. It's grown. It's now almost two and a half million people here. And the Raiders already have 35 people. They're a year away from moving here. They have 35 people in their foundation. They're doing community work all the time. So we see a lot of those guys like you who played for the Raiders. And some of them some of them played in training camp and, and didn't make the team, you know, and they're back right. and they're accepted by Mark Davis and the organization, once a Raider, always a Raider. Uh, and, and they really are appreciative. And it was great to see. I know you were out there last year, like signing autographs and all that kind of stuff. How was that reception from Raider fans when you went out there for the first time? Were you nervous about that at all? Um, yeah, uh, a little bit. I, I was more, I was more, I was really, uh, concerned with how team, you know, t- some teammates and past guys I didn't play with that were really legends. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was it was great. It was like, uh, and that's the thing that's amazing when you do get together um, with guys that you, that you played with. It was like no time had ever passed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. I know I, hearing hearing guys um, like Howie Long and Marcus Allen. They have a big charity softball event here this coming uh, this coming week, or they had one this week, and and able to talk to Marcus and, and ask about, and he, he still talks glowingly about you, um, especially from a talent perspective and what you, what you were able to show. Uh, and I think that, you know, the, the, everyone has kind of seen what happened over the course of your career. And of course your life, because you were under a microscope and, and sitting down and rereading that Michael Rosenberg piece, of course, from sports illustrated. Um, and if our listeners haven't read it, you should do that. You know, I found myself again, same age. I grew up in Southern California, so so the 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 persona and the legend that was Todd Marinovich, even at an early age when I was in high school at the same time, you know, reached all the way down to San Diego, as you know. Um, and as the story moved along, you know, I, I think I think I have the same point of view as these Raider fans have, which is, you know, I want you to do well. I want you to get to a good place face those issues that, you know, that, that, that got you to the point where you were with addiction and all those other things. And in that story, um, you know, you, Michael leads with this whole thing about the big lie, right? And the big lie had to do with you and your dad, Marvin, and his desire to mold you into this great athlete. Tell us what that lie was and how you finally came to grips with admitting to that and getting, at least getting to the point where you could start working, getting past it. Wow. It was, uh, well, first off, Michael uh, Rosenberg, who wrote it, I think did a fantastic job. Um, it's not easy to put all that together. Mm-hmm. And and it was, um, 
just really something that uh, has come up uh, as of late uh, in, in my recovery process. Right. And kind of wish <laughs> I got to it sooner. <laughs> it, it is what it is. And um, I just, uh, you know, as a, as a young child, um, you know, we put our trust and our, our parents. And I just bought, I bought in and I was all in, uh, to my dad's ideas. And not that I agreed, <laughs> agreed with them. Mm-hmm. I just, uh, like, like Michael wrote, I bought into the lie and it, it, it uh, it became my journey. Sure. And wouldn't change it. And, you know, and, and the thing is, it sounds cliche, wouldn't change a thing, but uh, it, it's, it's made, you know, it's made me who I am. Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing too, reading through it, um, Todd, it's, uh, you know, you relate, we all have different issues, different problems, different severity of issues and so on. But, you know, speaking myself, right. Uh, I had my issues growing up too, and and although they may be different than yours, you know, I could relate to 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 what you were talking about there because I think we all go through life trying to figure out who it is we are, what it is we want to be, um, and and how that happens. And of course, your parents are that example, that first example, and you don't know too what training they had. You don't get training. I mean, you're a parent now too. You know this. No one yeah. gives you training. It's not like they say, okay, here's the playbook, right? Like you did when you were no. playing football. There's no playbook on how to raise a kid. So if, no. if, if you and your dad, if, you, if your dad didn't have a, a great um, upbringing or if he had different issues, now I don't know much about your grandfather, but, but the point is you don't know where, what his background was and you don't know it's what. So you, yes, it's generational. And yes. It's, it's, it's just being passed, passed, passed. We could go on and so on and so on. So, the thing I do know is he did the best he could. Yes, with the with, with the information he had and wasn't, um, and, which can be hard to swallow. Mm-hmm. Wasn't trying to hurt me, right? In his mind, you know, in, in his mind. No, it, and it's so. You know, it, I think we're we're all. Um, sick to a degree mm-hmm. um we're all not in recovery obviously um but it's forced me to look at dark areas that are painful um to get to experience the after yes and um that is is something that is um, hard to describe that feeling yeah, and we, and we want to talk to you about that. We're going to um, step aside real quick here, Todd. When we come back, we'll continue uh, our conversation with Todd Marinovich on uh, where he's at, where he's been, and what he's learned, most importantly. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. This is Silver and Black today, live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Welcome back to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140 with our special guest, Todd Marinovich, former first round draft pick of the uh, Los Angeles Raiders in 1991. And of course, uh, star at USC. Uh, and uh, for folks like me who grew up in Southern California, someone you grew up hearing about constantly and, and knew who he was. Uh, and and Todd, we, before we went to the break, we're talking about... Um, you know, your recovery and getting to where you're at. Uh, and one of the things, too, that, that, that really hit home for me in reading um, Rosenberg's story from SI back in January was going back to those early years as a kid. You know, I have, I have four boys and a daughter. Um, they're always looking for my approval, affection, and attention. And for you, um, like you said, your, your dad did the best he could. It wasn't like he was trying to do anything to hurt you or anything like that. But the way that you were able to get that, you know, affection and love and attention from your dad was through this joint effort at the time, right, through sports. Why do you think it took so long for you to kind of realize 
how that had happened and how you'd been traumatized and, and how that led you to some of those very dark places that you've been throughout your life. Yeah. It, it, and you're dead on. It is a hundred percent childhood trauma. And I don't think uh, you can survive childhood, any of us, without experiencing some kind of trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, and and if it's like I experienced the physical, um, emotional, and verbal abuse, it uh, it stays with you. And and I, I didn't under, I didn't understand that. And there wasn't really a link. Uh, childhood trauma to addiction until kind of as of the last few years they're, mm-hmm. they're finding out and, and, and it, obviously hindsight sure it makes <laughs> it makes sense but that wasn't what the, we were t- talking about um, early on in my early recovery attempts so um, and then it's where you know, you're out as a person, and I've kind of thought a lot about, was this brought to my attention um, years ago, and I just wasn't ready to hear it. No. You know, and that that's a possibility. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's the journey, and uh, it's, I'm still... I'm still in it, and what, and will always be in it, and it's, and it's uh, something that I've you know, accepted. Yeah, and 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 that I I I'm with you at that same same juncture, which is all of life, your experiences, the pain, the suffering, all that stuff is part of who you are and builds you to a point, and 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 you have to work through it. To your point about trauma, everybody has trauma in their life, different different ways, different people that 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 heap it upon them. Uh, but clearly that's, that's something. And, and one, I don't know if you've, if you've read or heard about, um, John Eldridge, he wrote a book called wild at heart and in wild at heart, he, he called this thing that you experienced. And, and I'll be frank, me too, with, with my own father in different ways is he calls it the father wound. And he says, this father wound is something we like, all have. yeah, we all have it. Yeah. And it's passed yeah. on, like you said, generationally. Um, yeah. and, and you know, how your father raises you, they do the best that they can. That doesn't mean they're self-aware. It doesn't mean they have the emotional intelligence to, to do that. And so we have to learn generation by generation to get over yeah. that so that we don't pass it on to our kids or it gets yeah. better and better. Right. Yes. Without a doubt. You know, and I feel it with my own boy mm-hmm. and it's uh, that Baron turned 10 uh, yesterday. Nice. Yeah. What a big deal. It's, 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 uh, it's the coolest thing going for me. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> Without a doubt, and I, uh, I get to um, pass on through action, and I keep having to remind myself it's not the things that I say. He's watching what I do, mm-hmm. and um, it's the most challenging thing I've ever done, and I love it. Yeah. And, and, and talking about, you know, you, you, you finally, um, preparation for the interview, I went back and rewatched the, the 2005 documentary you did, the, the Marinovich Project with, with ESPN, um, and, and seeing what you were saying then versus what you had said in the article this year. Uh, and, and you've kind of, you're now at a place where you use the word abuse, right, with, with your dad, mentally, physically. Yes. Um, yes. Was it fear all those years that prevented you? from coming to grips with that? <laughs> you said it, Scott. Yeah. The big, the big one. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and didn't even realize that I was, uh, motivated by that. And, and uh, it ruled my life. Yeah. Fear. I was just scared. I'm scared. Still am. Uh, not as, you know, I, I'm, I'm a work in progress. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's in, it's, it's, it's in, the, it's in the, it's in the DNA almost it's in, <laughs> ingrained. Yeah. yeah that, that's right. Well, and, and Todd, we, you know, we, the thing about fear, right, is we all have fears and, um, you know, you hope that it's not of your dad, right. Or that situation in your case, it was, and, and you're working through that, which is, which is very encouraging and, but we all have it. Right. And, and I think the yeah. more, 
when you when you recognize it and you then approach dealing with it is when you start to heal. Uh, and it sounds like, you know, you're starting to get there, which is, which is fantastic. And for me, one of my opinions is as a dad in today's culture, uh, and this is where I talk about where, where, you know, you growing up under that, that microscope, um, I don't think we let kids be kids. We want to shuttle them from practice to practice, activity to activity, never let them find ways to entertain themselves. You know, you were on that program, uh, which of course, I mean, there was more articles written about your diet than I think your play at one time. Um, God, I know. Terrible. <laughs> and this frivolous and it was a lie. Yeah, it was a lie because you're. Yeah, I, I read that too. Your grandparents were giving you McDonald's and Oreos yeah. and stuff. Yeah, but that's a kid. You know, you 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 have to, as a father, you know, you prepare them for a, to 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 eventually be adults. But what 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 you need to do is you need to learn on your own. You learn through mistakes. You learn through imagination. You learn through playing um, around and just kind of being a kid. Um, should people look at your story as a way to learn how not to do it, or or is there is there a mixed lesson? Is there some things they should look at that that you and your dad were part of that were good that they should look at versus the things that are not? Hmm. I would never say what they should take from it. That's they're going to take what they're going to take, right? Sure. Yep. Um, and there's and there's and there's a lot there, so. Um, I, I, uh, you know, I, it, it's, it's not easy as a parent and, uh, and I'm getting, how cool is it? I get to, um, experience this end of it of, yes, of course I want to protect them. And, uh, the thing is, I think I know what's best because I've lived it, right. but I don't know if that holds true. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, I, I, I protect them if i see it you know an easy one wandering out into the street but i am not i'm trying to really expose them to as much cool stuff as i know and and let them you know decide and um it's uh and then sports are a part of i believe in them i I really do i think Mm -hmm. they're amazing they can be amazing have we gotten off uh, the path a little bit without a doubt. Um, but it's the best thing going, I think in our culture for kids, because I've, I've experienced it and, um, maybe I'm just not informed. Maybe there's more, but that's the route that they've, they're athletics. So they like to play. Most kids aren't, you know, like do the running, jumping and, and then when it becomes a team, that's why I really wanted Team sports are there's a magical quality when you all come together. It's great. So it is, and it it, it teaches kids, I think, uh, important skills about coping, getting along, working together, and that stuff you use not only in sports, but you work you use when you go to work. Uh, you use Correct. you use in your family, and so so to me, I agree with you. I think I think we've gotten off track. I think that this focus on kids playing one sport all year round. I played everything. I wasn't good in it, yeah. but, but we played everything, right? I mean, that was the point. Yeah, you're robbing them of an, a, a, a different experience in a in a way. Yeah. Um, now, if if the kid comes up with it himself, I'm just playing a one and yeah. because that's what I want to do. I get it. Yeah, but yeah. If they love a game so much that they want to focus on one, that makes a lot yeah. of sense. We'll talk, we're going we're gonna to take another break. When we come back, I want to talk to you a little bit about football and, and, and your career and growing up playing the sport and how some people feel like maybe you didn't love it, but you did uh, because of the involvement of your dad. So we'll, we'll dive into that here in just a second. Uh, we're talking to Todd Marinovich here on the Silver and Black today on CBS Sports Radio. 1140, don't go anywhere. There's more coming up. Hi, this is Scott Branson, and you're listening to the best of The Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Hey, this is Tim Brown, Hall of Famer. You're listening to Silver and Black Today. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today here on Father's Day on CBS Sports Radio 1140. And Tim Brown brings us back in, and we're talking to Todd Marinovich. Todd, you threw a couple That's touchdown awesome. passes. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, you just made me smile with that intro. Love. <laughs> Love Jimmy. What a player! Yes, what best a, receiver. Yeah, and, and a good guy great. too. Like I said, we we've been around him that's at cha- charity yeah. events. <laughs> but that's the thing, really. Uh, 
my experience is with great, I mean, great, great players. They were as equally as great off the field. Yeah. Which is amazing, but that's what I've experienced yeah. with all those guys. Oh, no doubt. And you, and you played with some great ones. Now, talking football a little bit, um, I think most of our listeners and Raiders fans know about your football career from the early age, of course, because it was well documented in every magazine, every newspaper through USC and then into the NFL. I mean, clearly we know and, and you know, you, you put in all that hard work, but you also have God given ability. How much, you know, how much did you I know you talk a lot about um, that you wanted to be you wanted to play You're a competitive guy. Um, yes. And a lot of people mistake the stuff with your dad as you being forced to play, but you loved the game, didn't you? Yeah, without a doubt. I think it's the greatest game on the, on the planet. <laughs> but um, the time that I spent, that's the thing. I, it, it, it taught me that, that there are no real shortcuts. And this is what he, my dad just laid out that if you want to be uh, really successful, this is what successful people do. And he related it to either gymnasts or swimmers, um, like Olympic caliber ones. They're doing it all day long. Right. And and I believed it. And so the three, four, five hours that I would put in, I was getting a break. Yeah. So it's perception. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah, and it's, it's uh, again, so well documented, uh, all the work that you put in. Uh, and then the, the, the fruits of that labor, right, which was uh, your performances in high school first at Modern Day and then Capistrano Valley uh, and then on to USC, where, of course, your, your dad was also a star. Um, when, when, you, when you got to USC uh, and, and you, you were playing football, and, and the one thing that I did not know about you until recently was the, the, the artistic side, right, and that you got there and – you were you were, were were having some trouble adjusting at USC, and then you 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 majored in art. Um, that USC experience, and of course, um, with Larry Smith and all that stuff that's well documented. Um, that was you were under so much pressure as a young kid, walking in there and starting. I think you're the first starter uh, mm-hmm. at USC uh, as a freshman since like 1941 or something like that. Um, that pressure, I mean. How how much pressure was it for you, and and how did it lead to to you really not having a great relationship with the coach? And he did some, you know, I know Allie, who's uh, your girlfriend, your 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 the mother of your kids, uh, his daughter. You, you're obviously uh, had a great relationship with her, but with Larry, you had a very mixed relationship. What was was that pressure on you on him that created that? Um, and how how. Is that where really the seeds of addiction and all that stuff started in earnest as far as actually using? There's a lot it's a big there. question, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We, we could break it down a little by little. You can answer a part of it. You don't answer all of it. I just started to yeah. – I riffed. I riffed, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Um, let's see. Well – the pressure at USC. Talk about that. Yeah, that that when I I just went back we, uh, a few years back that they were honoring a couple teams of, of the past, and so you get to see the current players without all the armor, right? Yeah. yeah. And I was the, what was hand down for me. It, it was shocking how young they were, <laughs> and I just it put in perspective like, man, I was them what i'm looking at they're just they're kids they really are they're young they're young people mm-hmm. and really young to be in what everybody looks it is uh it it, it was staggering um and it is, <laughs> it is it is what it is yeah. um whether it's right wrong or you know that doesn't matter it just uh blew me away because I uh, I thought differently, and uh, like I could handle uh, everything that goes with being a, a you know quarterback at a major university. It's it's, it's insane. Yeah, uh, is what it is. It's, so it's a lot to, of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. And and Todd, I mean, I you you were in the media all the time. Now imagine, I mean, I look at kids today. My daughter just graduated 
um, college. So, so my oldest just graduated college, which makes me feel really, really old. Wow. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's like, oh man, the, the hairline's going back, everything. Uh, but, but when I, when I look at those kids today, Todd, if you were growing up today, even like you had been grown up and nothing changed, imagine YouTube, uh, Facebook, all this stuff, the kids have even more pressure, don't they? I mean, with all social media and all this digital stuff, they're constantly tracked from the moment they're 10, 12 years old. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't imagine. No, no. And uh, it just adds to, you know, the pressure of it all. So, um, but still the experience it, 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 it is, is where it's at. Uh, you know, how they handle it is another thing, but that they'll get an experience without a doubt. Oh yeah, I encourage, and I encourage that. Yeah, experience that. Yeah, no, it's. I think it's important, and and again, we we all go through what we need to go through. We make mistakes, we have triumphs, and and that's all part of who we are. Now, you go yeah. from USC, and of course, uh, right before you leave, uh, you had the legal trouble with the arrest, with cocaine possession, all that stuff, and so you slip in the in the first round because of those issues and the persona that was out there about that you were that you were uh, a troubled guy. Uh, but Al Davis doesn't care if you're a troubled guy. If you can play, uh, if you have the ability yeah. to to play the game and help his team win, he was willing to give guys a chance. So they take you 24th in that first round. Talk about being drafted by the Raiders, uh, which basically your hometown, by the Raiders, and what it was like for you in dealing with Al Davis. Yeah, you know, looking at it, it Probably wasn't the best situation because <laughs> I, I didn't leave the, the Coliseum. Yeah. You know, I was right there. But my uh, my friends and teammates were you know, right across town. I was in Manhattan Beach, and uh, so I. But it, I would have imploded if I was in New York or <laughs> anywhere. So that setting was not really the issue. Um, but it was where it was where I wanted to play. I told I really I told my uh, agent at the time because it was really early in the morning, um, the draft, and I just said, "Wake me up when the Raiders are on the clock." And he did, and the <laughs> phone rang. And it was uh, I was just ecstatic. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, obviously things started well there, and when you when you came in for Jay Schrader and and played, and and that first game you had was was phenomenal. Um, playing for the Raiders and out. So Al Davis was surveilling you during your time because of your off the field issues. Um, did, how was that? Was the relationship with him then strained because he was always watching you or did you just get along with him and you just kind of, you were doing what you were doing. And so it was just part of the deal. Um, our relationship was not, uh, it was, it was un- well. He said it to me. It's unlike anyone I've had mm. uh, with a player, especially one this young. Only was it in two when he sat me down, and it it was really out of his hands, uh, as how he put it, because it was I was violating the NFL drug policy. It wasn't Raider policy I was violating, right? right. Um, and he. he you know, I was his boy. He he went out and picked me when nobody would. So um, it was. Uh, I carried that around for for two decades yeah. of that. Like I'd let him down, and I needed to amend that. And that's when I got to sit down with uh, Mark Davis. Well, that's... And he gave me the once a raider, always a raider. And so. Um, it's all about relationships I'm finding and in this recovery uh, lifestyle, it's really in life. It's about relationships. And I just really didn't, I'm learning how I, I, I just don't know really how. Yeah. Um, and it's a learning gig and it's awesome. It's not always easy. <laughs> But it's it, what I'm finding. It's worth those un, it, the uncomfortability of it all yeah. to get to the other side to, 
to to feel the, the benefits. Like you know, it, it relates to, to me. We're spending all those hours with my dad. Obviously, if I'm spending all those hours and, and I'm not seeing any benefit, that's no. I'm out. Yeah, it's, it's hard to stay motivated when you when you don't see a benefit, right? Which is why so many right. people try to lose weight and then they fail because if it doesn't happen fast enough, if you don't see the result, then you kind of give up yeah. on that. And and I mean, and I agree. You you have to. Nothing great comes from. Uh, ease. Nothing great no comes. Pain. Yeah, because I want to do stuff where there's no pain. Yeah. Well, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> that, you're not going to like doing that stuff. Yeah. No. And that's what happens. And but the the emotion, the emotional stuff. Oh, that's where I I want to avoid. Sure. Um, but it's uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, yes. that to- totally get that. Um, Todd, we're going we're gonna to take one more break. I want to keep you for one more segment. When we come back, I want to talk about the now. I want to talk about your art, and I want to talk about the future. Okay? Do it. All right. We're talking to Todd Marinovich, former Raider, former USC Trojan quarterback. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Hey, bye. On CBS Sports Radio 1140. All right, we're back talking to Todd Marinovich, former first round draft pick of the Raiders, and uh, we've we've gone through a lot of stuff uh, on Todd, his his life, his background, his career, and now we want to focus a little bit on now, what he's doing now, and uh, I want you all to go to MarinovichArt.com, MarinovichArt.com where you can see some of Todd's work, his, his painting, uh, and all this stuff, which is phenomenal, man. And, and, and I think for you, um, the painting, it sounds like from, from reading, and I want to ask you, um, getting, getting back to something that you really love, which is art. You studied it in college. Now you're doing it professionally for a while. Uh, how much is that helping with your recovery? Well, it's always been helping. I just wasn't aware of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the damn truth. I um, I knew it really early, like my earliest uh, of school, that um, it's the only part that time was non-existent other than recess. Yeah. So I knew that being active playing, I love to do, and I don't think about anything else but that with sports and art and uh so i knew i i knew it it just became not the focus really quick it wasn't like it was not allowed it just that's not what we're focusing on and it wasn't until uh i just sparingly you know did it uh over the years and it wasn't so my son, uh, Baron, was born that I just said, I'm all in. I'm going to either do it and it's going to work out or not. <laughs> and it's the fear. There you go. Yeah. And I just let's say, let's do it. And it's been amazing, really. Well, and it's I mean, it, I get to paint, paint pictures. It's, you, it's, it's awesome. Well, and it's it's I mean, it's it's great stuff, too. I mean, I was. You know, it's not, you're a talented guy, and I find that I don't care if you're physically talented, whatever it is, that usually talented people have multiple talents, right? So you had sports, of course, and you're able to paint. I know your dad was a a sculptor. He could have been a a very Uh good sculptor, as you've said. Um, And so to see that work and to see the reflection of your love of the game, too, of football, um, you, uh, even even basketball. I know you have a, a cool portrait up on your website of, of Magic Johnson uh, and all of that. It, it really is uh, amazing stuff, and and I hope that you continue to really to focus on it because um, you know you you have the ability to do something that that a lot of folks either have and can't reach or don't have. So um, it's it's good to see that you're able to to tap into that, and that it's helping you as well along this journey. Yeah, I love win wins, <laughs> and art, art art is that for me, for well, sure. And 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 in the few minutes we have left with you, Todd, I know this last question before we we let you go is is sort of a tough one. But with all the stuff we talk about, and you're very like you said in preparation for this interview and talking to you, you said, "Hey, I'm an open book. You know, nothing's off the table. I'm good with anything." Um, in the end, 
on your own time, <clears throat> one of the things I think that's important for any of us to get past wounds, to get past issues and trauma is eventually getting to the point where you can forgive. Um, is that is that a journey you're still on, you know, with your dad? Again, it, he, he did his best, right? But you still yes. have to get to a point where you forgive him for not knowing these things weren't the best for you. Uh, and and are you there yet? Are you getting closer? How do you feel about that? Oh, I, I'm there in that regard. I it, If it's just not one thing and then you're to the other side, I think it, I think it, it's ongoing. And forgiveness is, like you said, a huge one. There's a lot of also... Uh, where it's about me, uh, not about him. There's grief, um, grieving, uh, not being able to have a childhood. That, um, but then you get into comparing of what is normal. What is the what? What is the normal childhood? <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't. I don't no know. such thing. <laughs> uh, it's different for but, everybody, right? Yeah. So. Uh, it, it, it's expl- it's really exploring, and, and that's and sometimes it's exploring in art and in and in my uh, in my life and in in my past experiences is scary. But what I find, the, the more I do it, um, the better I feel, and it's not always easy. Um, and uh, the great part about it, I, I really I, I'm reflecting on things of my youth, and and then. I have uh, two beautiful children that are, I get to see how practicing what I would want it done to me with yeah. them and see how that works. And it's, it's, it's really about practice. I'm practicing. That's right, man. And, that's, that's how we learn. Yeah. That's how yeah. I learn. Well, I, I can tell you, Todd, we're, we're all keeping positive thoughts for you here. And I know fans are as well. The journey you know, to enlightenment, a happy, healthy life is, is as we've talked about, it's sometimes a lonely one. Um, and there's some things we got to get to on our own. But I, I know Raider Nation is behind you. Uh, they're wanting you to succeed in life, in your art, and, and, and in feeling good about your life and, and where you're going and, and raising that family. And you always have a spot here. We hope we can catch up with you again soon to check in on your progress and, more importantly, to see how your art's going uh, and we'll make sure we link up uh, marinovichart.com to our website. But, man, I, I just want to thank you. It's been, it's been great talking to you. And, um, you know, we're going we're gonna to keep in touch. And, and, and I appreciate it. How, how about I come in yes. when uh, the Raiders are in their new home? A- absolutely. You know, a little in studio. That would be bitching. Yes, and hopefully we'll be out there at the, at the stadium, too. And, and that's the thing, too. I know... Uh, you'll be part of that, and we're just about a year away from it, man. And they're they're building their headquarters here, which is actually not far from my house. So we'll uh, wow. we'll do that. But yeah, we'll get we'll get you out here. And I just want to thank you again and wish you the best, man. And and we're here if you need anything. I you know what? Side note: I just did a a, a, a big painting for Mr. Davis. Oh, did you? Of the new, of the new stadium. Oh, that's so killer. I, yeah, I've been checking progress. It's an amazing, amazing building. Yeah, it's going to be cool. I can't wait to see your art. Todd Marinovich, thank you for joining us today, my man. Right on. Thanks for having me, Scott. All right, Todd. We'll talk to you soon. We hope you've enjoyed this best of the silver and black today on this Sunday. We'll be back live 8 to 10 a.m. next week here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Thanks, Raider Nation. We'll talk to you soon.